Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're going to wait um, probably five more minutes for folks to show up and get to get started. Wish I could find a good way to put music on well. See some more folks coming in. I know we have a lot of, of people registered. And we'll just give it a couple more minutes, maybe. Well, it might be hard for people to bring themselves in from that spring sunshine this afternoon. So luckily this will all be recorded and available elsewhere for viewing later. Um, but I think maybe we'll go ahead and get started if everybody's ready, Eric and Sarah. Works for me. Great. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start recording. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for being here on this beautiful March day. Um, my name is Margaret Stern. I work for the Sioux and River Coalition um, and we're really excited to have you here to this joint event with Trout Unlimited Alaska today. Um, and we're really excited to have Sarah O'Neill here. Since this is a joint event, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on the Sioux and River Coalition and before I pass the uh, screen over to Eric Booten here. Um, again, I'm Margaret. I work for the Sioux Sitna River Coalition. We are a small grassroots organization based in the village of Talkeetna. Uh, we first formed in response to the Sioux Sitna Watana Hydro Project, uh, but now monitor a bunch of different issues that have the capacity to alter the watershed um, from West Sioux Sitna Access Road to still looking at Sioux Hydro, um, as well as the Sioux Sitna Basin Recreation Rivers Management Plan. Um, this is part of our winter speaker series that we hold every year. Um, we have monthly ta educational talks um, and lectures from folks that are out in the watershed doing incredible research um, like Sarah. And so we're really excited to have her here this evening and to welcome you all to this event. Um, before we really dive in, I'd love to thank the, sponsor the sponsors of our winter speaker event. That includes um, the Jessica Stevens Foundation, the Chase Community Council, the Talkeetna Community Council, and a variety of individual donors that make all of this possible. Um, I'd also like to note that when it moves over to Sarah um, to give her presentation, you are welcome to enter questions into the chat um, and we will hold all those questions till the end, but please type them in as you have them and we will get them answered for you. 
Um, and just so you all know, the Sioux Sitna Basin Recreation Rivers Management Plan is a plan that um, designates six different rivers in our watershed um, as recreation rivers. Um, and this management plan helps to mitigate different user groups along the waterways um, and helps protect the system. Right now, the plan is up for revision. And so we've been closely fo following this whole process. Um, and there is a 13 member advisory board um, that is working on making changes on the project. And there are lots of opportunities to engage and to get involved in this. Um, so I'm going to pass this over to Eric Booten to give a little introduction to Sarah and to you. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, and thanks so much for uh, letting us join you this evening. Um, like Margaret said, my name is Eric Booten. I'm the Angler Engagement Manager for Trout Unlimited. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Trout Unlimited, we work throughout the state to protect, connect, and restore uh, fish habitat, which is the basis of the fisheries that we all as Alaskans enjoy, uh, which provides so much for our state and for local economies. Um, and for the past year and a half or so, I have been uh, reading and enjoying the uh, Sioux Sitna Basin Recreational Rivers Management Plan here um, and attending the advisory board meetings and the work sessions that we have uh, been hosting. Um, and personally, I've been able to spend time on five of the, the six rivers um, of floating whitewater, uh, catching rainbow trout on mouse patterns, um, getting into um, a couple uh, Chinook, as well as catching some coho. And um, they were some just phenomenal experiences. And I look forward to spending more time out on these rivers. Um, and uh, there's no doubt that part of what made them so special was um, the forethought to consciously manage these uh, important resources by uh, the prior generation uh, of Alaskans. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening to learn more, because um, with the review of the Susitna Basin Recreational Rivers Management Plan, we have an opportunity to really help um, protect and uh, maintain a management plan um, that helps steward uh, resources that are just of the utmost importance to um, the Matsu Basin uh, anglers and residents and beyond. Um, and so I'm going to quickly uh, introduce our guest presenter this evening, um, Sarah O'Neill. Uh, Sarah is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fisheries Science in Daniel Schindler's lab. Uh, she also owns and operates Aqua Dolce Freshwater Consulting, which conducts research and outreach on impacts of development to freshwater ecosystems. Sarah has over 20 years of experience working in lakes and rivers around the world, primarily within salmon and trout habitat. She has specialized in uh, water quality, aquatic plants, salmon and trout ecology, and their interactions with policy. Sarah received her bachelor's degree in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology from the University of Washington, and her master's degree is in organismal biology and ecology from the University of Montana's uh, Flathead Lake Biological sta uh, <laughs> Station. Um, and uh, Sarah O'Neill generated a report called Salmon and Trout Ecology, and uh, habitat of Sioux Sitna Basin Recreational Rivers, and the presentation she will be giving tonight has also been given before the Matsu Sitna Habitat Partnership, as well as the um, advisory board members currently reviewing the Sioux Sitna Basin Recreational Rivers Management Plan. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Sarah. Thanks, Eric. Boy, there were a lot of syllables and a lot of those words in my bio I gave you at the last minute weren't there. Sorry about it, that. It was an exercise. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to have to figure out how to share my screen with you guys. Sorry about this. just never goes as smoothly when you're in front of people. All right, so you can see my screen now? Okay. I'm gonna try to make big. Okay. There we go, so, looking good. All right. Thanks so much, Margaret and Eric. 
for the opportunity to share this information with you guys and for the <laughs> um, word gymnastics, Eric. I appreciate it. I uh, the the information that I'm providing today or talking about today is something that Trout Unlimited, Eric and Nellie Williams and others at Trout asked me to put together in light of the review of the Recreational Rivers Management Plan. Um, and what they asked me to do was just to basically consolidate and review all the available information I could find on those recreation rivers and kind of uh, other relevant, other information relevant to, to salmon. So I uh, appreciate the work that Eric's been putting into this and also very briefly, not nearly as extensively reviewed the Rock Rivers uh, management plan, you know, as I was starting to work on this project and uh, found it to be really one of the most like proactive, protective state of Alaska, you know, salmon documents I've, I've seen. And I have been working on Alaska salmon issues since, well, I guess it's been about 15 years now. So I, I, I find it really impressive um, and appreciate the need for information in order to inform those decisions going forward. So what these guys asked me to do was just, like I said, to compile that. So the, the report that I produced that we, we can certainly send those of you that are interested, we can send you a link to, compiles all the information I could find. I have since been told about a, a couple of things I would like to incorporate in addition, but everything that is publicly available is in the bibliography. Almost everything you can just link to from the bibliography itself. And there are a few things that aren't open access. Uh, and I think these guys are gonna send my contact information out as well. So if there is information you're looking for that you see in there that you can't access from the bibliography or please feel free to email me and I can provide it. So the report, what I, you know, I, I basically compiled everything I could find from the academic nerd journals, the peer reviewed literature to government reports to, you know, private consulting McKinley group type reports. Um, and I, and like I said, I know I, I did miss, I, since sort of rolling this report out. I've heard about a couple of, of things that I would like to add, but uh, we'll get to those at some point. Um, I think maybe the overarching theme of my review was that there is there is some really good information and I, I, a lot of really good hard work has been put into researching the state of salmon in the Susitna Basin and these recreation rivers. But there is also a lot to be learned. So I got my start on Alaska salmon issues in Bristol Bay and got quite, well, I guess I grew to take for granted the amount of information that managers are collecting and working with in Bristol Bay to make management decisions. I just sort of thought because it was the first watershed I worked in, in Alaska, I had this idea in my head that that's just like how Alaskans manage salmon, this impeccable system where nearly every fish is counted. So I was a bit dismayed to find that that is very clearly not the case uh, in Cook Inlet and, and particularly in the Susitna River, uh, the Susitna Basin Recreational Rivers. So, oh, I should have gotten there earlier. Uh oh, let's see. Oh, I think it's doing this thing where it automatically advances my slides. 
we'll see. Uh, I should have advanced this one earlier, which is just, just highlighting those rivers that were um, protected in the Recreational Rivers Management Plan. And so my review was focused on these rivers. Like I tried to find everything I could about these rivers specifically, but in many cases there, there isn't a lot of specific information about some of these individual tributaries. So some of it is more cook and let, cook and let wide, including particularly uh, the, oops, pardon me, sorry about that. Okay, so including the kind of economic information, which certainly highlights the importance of the commercial and sport fisheries of the Susitna River Basin and of, of Cook Inlet in general, just because that's where most of the information is derived, but including the Susitna to Alaska in general and um, the number of jobs and cost share generated. But I had, there is there, I missed a borough report in particular uh, that may have more information about sport fisheries, but I do think it's worth mentioning that in general, sport fisheries in Cook Inlet, unlike most other places in Alaska, are as important, as commercially important, as commercially valuable as uh, commercial fisheries. There's, I think as, as potentially a lot of you on this meeting know, there is a lot of sport fishing interest. There's a lot more access to these rivers. And so uh, sport fishing is is quite important in the Susitna Basin. So I think perhaps the preponderance of the peer-reviewed like nerd journal information on the Sus on Cook Inlet and the Susitna revolves around that endangered Cook Inlet beluga whale population. They have you know, been listed as endangered and consequently that's generated a lot of research activity around the beluga whales. And this is a graph showing the activity of belugas that just basically population counts out in front, out in various areas of Cook Inlet. So the Susitna Delta is represented here in the red and you can see that most of the time, most of the belugas are hanging out at the Susitna. And we know that the belugas prefer, especially Chinook salmon, but also other salmon species to feed on. And so they're really relying on that Susitna population in order to keep going. This is another paper about those Cook Inlet Belugas, which is, it's a bit more confusing um, in that it, the, the left axis over here is just, is sort of like compiling the information about salmon in abundance. And if I remember correctly, it's particularly coho and king salmon abundance that they have converted into basically Beluga calories, you know, uh, so the belugas come for their mixed salmon and they convert that to however many calories these belugas are eating. And the uh, number of salmon in the Susitna, what this is showing, so the, the whale numbers, the, oops, again, I apologize. The babies, number of beluga babies are represented in the orange here and the the numbers the the calving rate so the number of babies per cow are uh what this x-axis over 
here is. Um, and all the other green, blue, and red are the numbers of salmon. And the, the bottom line is just that the more salmon there are, the more baby belugas there are. So there's absolutely no doubt that salmon are crucial to the persistence of that endangered beluga population. So king salmon are the preferred salmon species of belugas and also are, in spite of recent news, I saw that one of the earliest closures was recently announced for, uh, for cooking the king salmon, but in general, kings, Susitna River king salmon are it's the fourth largest population in the state. And given the state of the Kuskokwim and Yukon anymore, which I'm sure you're well aware of, the Susit in some years, you know, they are even more important. And I guess to me that just highlights the importance of you know, as as dire as the situation may steam with the king salmon they are still one of the last best and and that really uh warrants some serious consideration about conserving the habitats that support them and that this recreational rivers management plan does uh does relatively proactively support so in uh you know, the king salmon and the sit in a relative to the Kenai, there is a fair about it, a fair amount of information about that. And um over over many years, it does look like the Susitna basically doubles the amount of king salmon escapement over the Kenai River. But like I said, and as I'm sure we all know, that kings are not doing great they are suffering they have experienced closures fish and game has attempted um some hatchery restocking you know hatchery supplementation but they are still certainly a, a very important population worth effort to support that that recreational rivers that the and it's last form at least cer certainly does you know uh highlight it does go to some great effort to to uh protect those rivers also fish and game has recently developed some new genetic markers that are specific to the susitna basin um they haven't they're they're pretty new so there's some work yet to be done but they will be very they will certainly be very useful in um prioritizing which rivers are producing the most king salmon and that may help inform decisions about which you know which rivers to uh prioritize for conservation as far as sockeye salmon they are probably not surprisingly the most commercially valuable species in the Susitna. Um, and while those Cook Inlet sockeye pale in comparison in comparison to Bristol Bay, I mean, the truth is that Bristol Bay knocks everybody out of the park or out of the North, North Pacific, but taking Bristol Bay out of the equation cook and let produces uh nearly a third of the remainder of Alaska's sockeye an interesting thing about the sockeye and the Susitna relative to Bristol Bay and many other places, you know, kind of how fish biologists tend to think about sockeye is that they rely on lake systems in many, if not most places that sockeye live. They 
after they incubate, you know, after they're spawned and they incubate in the gravels, they emerge and they migrate to lakes where they feed for a year or two before going to the ocean. And then Susitna, because in part, because it's not such a lake dominated system like Bristol Bay is, there are a lot more of these river type sockeye. And there is some evidence that suggests that those river type sockeye that don't rely as much on lakes are actually could potentially be more adaptable, um, e more capable of adapting to climate change and other factors that are threatening salmon populations because of their genetic variability. Numbers also suggest fishing game, largely fishing game numbers also suggest that the Yetna in particular produces about 75%, three quarters of the Susitna Basin sockeye. And, and again, because the Yetna is not particularly lake dominated, that might explain this uh, river type life history, we call it, but this tendency for them to rear, to spend their freshwater lives in rivers as opposed to lakes. But as I'm sure you all know, they also are another uh, stock of yield concern. They're, you know, they have also been on the decline overall. So there are a couple of long standing weirs. There are many ways that fish scientists count fish. I think Alaskans in general are far more literate in these things than even a lot of fish scientists in Washington where I currently am. But uh, there are only a couple in the whole Susitna Basin. There are only a couple of really long standing weirs. I'm aware, so weirs are these uh, big structures across entire rivers that funnel the fish into uh, basin basically that where scientists can count every single fish and they get blown out you know they have their own issues but hands down they're the most re reliable you know they're the best source of fish population information that we have adult fish return information anyway um and only two weirs in throughout the Susitna Basin and on these recreational rivers have been operated for the long term. I am aware of several other weirs that fishing game has operated on a shorter term more recently, but I have not yet accessed, I have not yet been able to access that information online. So there are a few more, but they also are shorter term. And um, they, uh, yeah, well, like I said, I just can't, I haven't been able to get my hands on the data yet. So the, like I said, the thing about weirs is they actually, they, they handle the fish individually. So they get really reliable counts. They're more consistent. They're longer term. The alternative are aerial counts, which are just sporadic and they're subject to whatever environmental conditions are going on at the time, you know, whether or not you can even see the river very well or what the river is doing, if the river's blown out and you can't see the fish, all kinds of things like that. So they're just, they're far less reliable and, and they really do dominate the population data information for the Susitna Basin. Um, so I, I think perhaps, so the Deshka is one of the rivers that has information. And as good as it is, I think it's important in this context to highlight these gaps so you can see that some of these lines just disappear at times. And that's because there aren't, there just are no data. Um, and that, also, it's I, the other one is on the little, little Susitna, and that is even 
more pronounced there that the they just weren't able to keep the weir in all the time and or there were certain species they weren't paying particular attention to it may be worth noting that uh in the last slide i'll go back in the last slide pink salmon there are so many pink salmon in the dashka like 20 times uh as many pink salmon as other species, they're the pink line in this graph that they have the separate axis over here. So there are tons and tons of pinks in the Deshka and the in the little Susitna that counts for chum. We had to separate chum to a second axis there. Um, also, there's information indicating that at least at some point in time, the coho salmon fishery, the little Susitna coho salmon, was the second largest freshwater coho salmon fishery in the state. Whether or not that's still true isn't entirely clear, but is pretty interesting. Where to go to get your silvers? So moving on to some threats, some, you know, kind of conservation issues associated with salmon in the Susitna Basin. I'm sure that some of you are aware that pike have been introduced. You know, they are native in some places in Alaska, but they were not native to the Susitna Basin and were illegally introduced in the 60s and are now considered one of the major factors of Chinook salmon declines. Um, so this is a picture from a fish and game report that <laughs> was analyzing pike diets, and they are estimated to consume a great number. Like, I think, I think the figure was 20% of their diet is little salmon. This, this particular picture sure makes it look like on this day for this fish, 100% of his diet was little baby Chinook salmon. So some modeling efforts have been conducted that estimate that if pike are if pike populations are allowed to increase, they have the potential to completely extirpate multiple species of salmon in Alexander Creek. They've also been found in the Deshka River. And I think because of the difference in habitat types, they're still problematic. They're still consuming a lot of salmon in the Deshka. But because of the difference in habitat types, the Deshka doesn't have as much slow flowing lake type complex, uh, or I'm sorry, more simple habitat. They are, they seem to be doing a better job of getting along the uh, Deshka River pike and salmon. Like I said, still a problem, but but not as likely to just completely wipe out any salmon populations just because of the difference in habitat types. But because of all the suppression efforts have been ongoing and have have taken out, over 25,000 pike have now been destroyed. And I, uh, and I imagine that will just be an ongoing effort because actually getting rid of a, an established species, a self-propagating species like that entirely is, is beyond difficult, arguably impossible. Another threat is this 
plant that is considered this this is an aquatic freshwater aquatic plant that is considered invasive in Alaska. You may have heard of it. Some people call it Elodia and others call it Elodia. I have a tendency to call it Elodia, but it doesn't, that doesn't matter so much is that it is in Alaska and it, it is growing like a weed in Alaska. And the problem with plants that grow out of control like this in freshwater systems is among among just their kind of nuisances that they cause they in the fall time when light starts fading and they start dying back senescing that process consumes a lot of oxygen and i think probably needless to say salmon and all of the other critters that they depend on, you know, that they eat and so on, uh, require salmon, or I'm sorry, require oxygen to survive. So that's problematic. Another problem with the Elodea is that it facilitates sort of like, it provides hiding places for these pike that are already problematic. So those pike can hide and ambush more salmon with this you know, plant structure that they didn't have before it became, before it started growing out of control. And last but not least at all ever is the threat of climate change. Some colleagues of mine have done a study of dozens of rivers around Cook Inlet um, of, and looking at temperature specifically and modeling what might happen to temperature in light of uh, climate change going forward, climate change predictions. They found that the Deshka River, so they didn't, they didn't measure temperatures in rivers and any of the other recreational rivers, I should say, except for the Dashka, but of the rivers that they did sample all over Cook Inlet, all around Cook Inlet, uh, the Dashka was the second, was like the second warmest or warming faster than all but one other river around the basin. And they used that temperature data they collected along with the International Panel on Climate Change's predictions for temperature, for temperature increases going forward to, to estimate how much habitat might be lost uh, based on those predictions. And they use this number of 13 degrees Celsius, which, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a threshold over which incubation, like egg, many life history stages of salmon suffer above that degree. It gets harder to spawn, uh, incubation may take longer or may not take long enough so that salmon emerge when they're not quite ready out of the gravel, so on and so forth. But what they did with this model was um, compile information about how much habitat could be lost with, you know, how much habitat we might be able to estimate might be lost with expected climate change regimes re regimes and so the red is like the most habitat loss and the blue is the least down here at the, you know on the on the key and their estimate is that with with projected climate increases and these are pretty moderate projections they didn't use the most extreme ones that spawning habitat specifically could be reduced anywhere from 
17 to 89% under these predictions. And I think this is this is my last slide, and it's a, I'm, I apologize, it's a terrible table, but it's just to bring us back to like what we're doing here, rethinking this very proactive, really conservative recreational rivers management plan. Um, the whole point of this table is not at all the nonsense going on as much as the nuns, the gaps, the data gaps. This is simply a summary of the population information that we have for the recreation rivers, you know, over time for each species. So this is like sort of the most basic salmon information a person could ask for, right? And there are a uh, lot of very large gaps. In some cases, there we, we have no information whatsoever. And the reason that I included this atrocious looking thing is because I think in order, you know, in light of this revisiting the Recreation Rivers Management Plan, the whole, like, the whole point of decision, the whole the, the only way to make decisions, to use the precautionary principle to do, you know, to protect salmon, which we know are declining all over Cook Inlet, in spite of some really, you know, great numbers that came out of this report. We we all know it's it's not a rosy picture. And so any consideration of potentially decreasing protections just is very tenuous. I mean, it's it's risky. It's incredibly risky under maybe any circumstances, but certainly without enough information to inform those decisions. So, um, that was my personal take home from this literature review was just like, we need to know a lot more before we make any drastic decisions, many, any big decisions that might further threaten salmon habitat that uh, is clearly valuable, but also clearly struggling. And I think that's, I think that's my last slide. So yeah, um, with that, I think these guys are going to send out a link to the report if you want more information. There, there is quite a bit more. And like I said, the there are links to most of the information in the bibliography. And if there is any information missing in please reach out to me. My email is on this slide and I suspect you can get it from Margaret and Eric also. Um, I'm happy to share, share it and answer any questions you might have over email also and also happy to answer questions now. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for the for the overview of your and in, going into detail with your work. Um, does anybody out there have any questions this evening? Feel free to enter them into the chat, and we'll or the question and answer section, and we'll pass them along. Sarah, what do you, um, what is it about those two river systems where you have the pinks and the chums that are so high? Um, what are, what, what do you attribute that to? <laughs> it's a great question. I don't know the answer, I, but I, but I thought about it when I was making those secondary axes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. 
down here, yeah, it doesn't matter what I, it, down here I would think about proximity to the ocean, but that's not the case there. So, I wish I had a better answer, but I am in as much wonderment as you are. <laughs> um, Becky Long asked, can Elodia provide hiding places for salmon? Yes. Hi, Becky. <laughs> uh, how lovely to hear your name. Yes, it can provide hiding places for salmon, but, you know, like um, juvenile salmon are like, you know, I guess there's all kinds of intelligence, but they might not be as good as, as good at hiding as adult pike, if you get my drift. Um, Catherine so, asked, so the hiding places for pike are, you know, the pike might be able to take more advantage of the hiding places than the salmon. Um, Catherine is asking if the review board includes folks, um, in, in, any indigenous folks or, or representatives on the board. Um, at this point, I don't think it does. Eric, you might be able to better answer that. Um, uh, at this point, it, it does not. Um, there are a fair amount of tribal entities that have been uh, quite involved in the review process so far, but there is no one on the um, advisory board um, representing Indigenous communities. Um, Bob asks, are ocean survival rates for salmon, smolts, or juvenile, has that changed in the last 20 years? Um, and what is the species survival difference between kings and sockeyes? So. The, I'm sorry, Margaret, can you repeat it? The species yes, I can. That's a, it's a multi-pronged question. Um, are ocean survival rates for salmon smolt or juvenile changed in the last 20 years? Yes, they do change. They, they are kind of constantly changing and our rubric in the past has been um to predict it has been what we call the pacific decadal oscillation which is related to el nino and la nina and how that affects river temperatures but the truth of the matter is that our ability to predict that has kind of been obliterated by climate change. I don't know if you guys remember that the, the blob several years ago was really just a, <laughs> the beginning of the end of our ability to predict how ocean survival rates change. And I, truth of the matter is we were never great at it, but now we just, we're kind of not quite, but damn near back at square one. So then what are those species specific survival differences between kings and sockeye? And I just can't tell you that. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could. I, I, you know, there are, there certainly are people that have a lot more information about it than I do. Um, but I, because I focus so much on freshwater, I'm not, I'm not up on that literature. What were the biggest holes that you saw in the literature? Like what, how, and how would you like to see those filled in moving forward? Wow, that's a good question. Like if I had all the money in the world, well, given, you know, in light of both the Rec Rivers Management Plan, I mean, certainly I would put weirs on there for a long time before I would make any permanent decisions or long lasting decisions. I would just monitor populations and, and ideally small and adult, but small traps are pretty hard in Alaska, but I would monitor, I mean, yeah, small to adult ratios. Um, but man, I mean, I, I could spend hours <laughs> answering that question. <laughs> 
I'll design the study. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be big and expensive and take a long time. Uh, you know, habitat isn't really defined there. There, you know, a lot of habitat and a lot of that stuff can be done remotely anymore. Um, but yeah, I think I would start with small traps and weirs. Is there any way when you look at, um, to look at past uh, sport fish data to kind of extrapolate what what runs used to be like is there a meth method for doing that there are some old fish and game reports that are reviewed and you know that are summarized in my report that do that and quite honestly i just have to trust them because the creel data aren't they're not great. They're just, they're not, you know, it was like, just like how all of my mentors got their fancy degrees was going out and observing the landscape and the fish runs and the, you know, river movement and uh, reporting on it. And that's kind of what those old fish and game reports are like. So there aren't really hard and fast numbers in those reports so I don't think given what I can find anyway that I that I could do that but that is what some of these guys did in those reports from the I think even back to the 60s but certainly 70s and 80s and I believe them I think they were doing good work And uh, Sarah, you mentioned uh, additional research in weirs and getting a lot of good data on adult um, salmon and juvenile salmon would just be really helpful in uh, actually knowing more about the health of these systems. And um, as at least in the meetings for the Recreational Rivers um, Advisory Board, there's been uh, a lot of discussion in, in while reviewing the plan, um, lots of comments as far as um, additions that could be added to strengthen it. And I, and I will note that a lot of the, there's been a lot of conversation about the need for weirs. Um, and I think that's great and something that a lot of people are pushing for. Um, but in the in the spirit of review, is there anything that you would consider adding to strengthen? In the spirit of review, is there anything I would consider adding to strengthen the like weird data the plan in general oh well i haven't reviewed it as extensively as you have eric and like i said i i, I was floored by how forward thinking the thing was um i think i would have to look at it in that with that lens specifically in order to better answer your question but just yeah i mean just like the the i think it it might sound it might be old hat at this point but um just the precautionary principle just don't make any drastic certainly don't roll back any protections without sufficient information which gets back to weirs and, you know, like my sort of bucket list, dream list of data that we should have, we should have had. So I didn't say to this group that I'm from Washington state, I'm back here now. It's where I started working on salmon rivers and I, it's where I very intentionally left because I frankly lost hope for restoration here. It was, I mean, without just it's hatcheries, we just, hatcheries are our only option down here. I think Alaska has a different, 
I think Alaska is in a different position and that's why I went there. But the mistake that we made or of many, <laughs> of the many mistakes that we made, maybe let's say the mis biggest mistake that the scientists may have made was just not ever fully characterizing a single system, population data, habitat data, food web data, all of, you know, the whole nine yards. We didn't get it until we didn't have any salmon left. We didn't even start looking until we didn't have any salmon left. So it's too late. We can't restore what we don't, you know, what we never understood. So that's my wish. I guess that's my like dream for Alaska salmon science. I put you on the spot there, um, Sarah, but I uh, appreciate your answer and I think you you did it well. And um, that's one of the fortunate things about Alaska is we are in a position to be able to learn um, from what has happened elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I went north once upon a time. We have another question from the group that is, what do you think the reason for the decline of returning kings is? <laughs> you know, I've been in a room, I've been in several rooms at this point with the like smartest guys in the world that in my field, I should say, the smartest salmon nerds in the world and nobody knows. And 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 the, I think maybe the most important takeaway from that or lesson to learn, whatever, is simply that there isn't an answer. Unfortunately, there never is just one answer. It's everything. It's all of the things that we're doing, you know, ranging from individual bycatch to climate change. So it's, you know, fishermen in the watershed to emissions coming from furthest place away we can think of. Unfortunately, it's it's not, it's just not simple. Yeah, and that kind of goes to a comment that um, someone else has that uh, there's a lot of problems with pike in the basin. Um, a lot of fishing going on and with between um, potential lack of enforcement or invasive species, it gets to be pretty complicated. Yeah, there's nothing straightforward about <laughs> ecology. Uh, you know, other than that, like, if you let water flow downhill, in the way that it needs and wants to do, that usually, you know, on its own course, right? In its own time, that usually does, goes a long way. But it's easier said than done. So the road, you know, the, the road, I think the Rec Rivers Management Plan is um, really quite exceptional. The road concerns me because the second you well changes to the management plan concern me too. But the second you start putting culverts, like forcing water into one confined space, culverts or bridges, but especially culverts, you've you've just completely bisected the system at every single one of those pinch points. And there's like, I can't, I just read it the other day. I can't remember, but there's a gazillion of them along that road. I think the newest number is 170 something. I'll double check that. But it's significant and some of them close to Rec Rivers. Yeah, it's not going to do any already struggling salmon populations, any favors at all.
but ultimately, I mean, it's just a trade-off, you know, it's a societal decision. The hard part is figuring out how to make it fairly and collectively and so on and so forth. Well, does anybody have any additional questions before we kind of wrap up? Or Sarah, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to impart before we before we wrap? Well, not really. I might just apologize for my, I'm still getting my, you know, land legs back. This is my third presentation since COVID and I got off to a rocky start, but I hope it made some sense to folks. And and please don't hesitate if there's anything that I could clarify for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm happy to talk with you. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and thank you, Sarah. I know it uh, takes a lot to uh, get in front of rooms of people uh, to join a, a virtual audience as well and deal with the technology. So thanks so much for joining us and, and sharing your research. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, Sarah's um, contact information is on the screen here. And like she said, she's open answering questions. And, and I know that uh, is the truth. Um, myself and Margaret are also here um, on behalf of Toronto Limited and SRC and happy to take um questions as well so please don't hesitate um to reach out um and i wanted to thanks um thank everyone again for being here to learn more about um sarah's report and the um habitat and ecology of the susitna basin um recreational rivers and um Sarah did mention the borough report that had been done on sport fishing economics in the Matsu Valley. Um, and that report showed that the sport fishing um, industry in the valley um, is valued at close to 60 million annually um, and provides around 370 jobs, which is uh, great for the local economy. And much of that economy um, is buoyed by these recreational river systems. I mean, uh, the Deshka alone is a huge contributor. And um, I mean, while we have so many issues happening across the Susitna Basin um, as a whole, including warming water and invasive species, pike and elodia, urban development, Chinook decline, uh, and other struggling, struggles like funding for great things like weirs um, and enforcement, um, it can be really challenging to balance all of these and kind of sort through how we can have an impact. But um, for, for those who have been uh, on this presentation, the review of the Susitna Basin Recreational Rivers Management Plan is ongoing. Um, and later this spring, we're expecting to have um, another comment period coming up regarding proposed changes to the plan, which will be the next opportunity for those who care about the um, six recreational rivers to be involved. So I sure hope you will join us then. Um, and with that, I'm just going to share a few events that Trotted Unlimited has coming up um, this Thursday uh, for some spring break fun. We are hosting a Coco with Cohos, uh, a family-friendly educational event up at Eklutna Lake. Uh, it'll be a self-guided tour. Um, the trail will be roughly three miles or so long, um, can be walked, um, fat biked or snowshooter Nordic skied, and along the way you'll learn about um, the needs of salmon and um, the challenges that Eklutna salmon face. Um, Trout Unlimited, we also have our uh, spring shindig on um, Thursday, March 23rd at 49th State Brewing Company. It'll be an evening of uh, celebration, comedy, and conservation, um, including live and silent auctions. And I'll drop these in the chat as well. And the last thing is uh, the Fly Fishing Film Tour hosted by the South Central Alaska Trout Unlimited chapters coming back and tickets are on sale uh, for April 11th through 13th at the Beartooth. And um, with that, thanks again, Sarah. And thank you, Margaret. And I'll pass it to Margaret. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Sarah and Eric. <laughs> it was fun to do a joint event with another organization. So I hope we can do some more of these. Um, and I'm going to highlight a few things that we have coming up as well, the Sioux River Coalition and just the general um, Sioux Sitna drainage. 
Um, as Sarah mentioned, the West Susitna Industrial Access Road is an issue that Susitna River Coalition is closely following. Um, and there are going to be two public meetings coming up that are going to be hosted by ADA, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority. So those are going to be um, on March 23rd at Squentner Roadhouse, um, if anybody happens to make it out there. Um, and the other will be on March 31st at Evangelos in Wasilla. So if you have any questions um, prior to those events, please contact us and we have some great information about uh, the access corridor um, available for you. Um, in addition, the Matsu Borough is currently working on trying to repeal a, re a setback ordinance um, and for, for building. Um, and riparian zones are incredibly important. Setback Building setbacks are incredibly important for salmon habitat. Um, and so on March 20th, um, there will be a public hearing for the setback ordinance with the Planning Commission, the Matsu Borough Planning Commission. Um, on April 4th, the repeal will be introduced to the Matsu Borough Assembly. Then on April 18th, the Matsu Borough will hold a hearing for that setback. And we have a bunch of information about that. You can also get on our mailing list. I'll be sending something out this week with more information about um, what is going on there. Um, also, on April 11th, we will have our next winter speaker event, um, and that will be with Luke Mel, and he will be highlighting some of his recreation in, and trips in the West Susitna drainage. Um, and that's, we've focused on hunting and fishing in the region, so it's going to be really exciting as spring come, rolls around to see some of the other opportunities there are to get out into that region. And I would also like to flag that Matanuska Electric Association elections, board elections are coming up. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. We are going to have a candidate forum. Um, that date will also be sent out in our next uh, newsletter. Um, so you can learn about who is running for the MEA board. Um, and those individuals on the board help drive decisions surrounding energy in the basin and help prevent things like the Sioux City Watana Hydro Project. Also coming up, come see us at the sportsman shows. We'll be in um, Wasilla, uh, I believe that's next weekend. Um, and then we'll also be in Kenai and in Fairbanks. So come chat with us. We'll have a bunch of good information for you. And uh, please reach out if you have any more questions, either to Eric, Sarah, or I will be happy to answer them for you. So thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. And thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. and been really Thank great you guys. And uh, thanks for everybody for being out here. It's still sunny outside. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jealous. It's not sunny here. It's dark. Yeah. <laughs> you can see that out your window. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.